All right, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, verse 1. For follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. I think you have to remember uh, the context of this passage. Uh, that as we showed, of course this whole letter is to the church. But when you look at chapters 12, 13, and 14, and in truth, he's actually began this argument all the way back in at least chapter 10. Is he's trying to get us to understand uh, the importance uh, of Everything in the church that we put an emphasis on edifying the church. What I mean by that is uh, just the example from last week. In 1 Corinthians 13 and in chapter 12, uh, he makes a statement. That charity is a better gift uh, than faith. Now, that sounds very strange in the light of the Bible as a whole. Uh, because when you consider the Bible and just general Christian life, again, faith has the priority. I mean, God says without faith it's impossible to please Him. That anything that's not a faith is sin. Uh, and so you see in that that if He were to say <laughs> that charity is more important than faith, it would start to cause some problems. Unless you understand the context. He's talking about spiritual gifts and how that every ability or gift God gives you is meant for the edifying of the body, the, the church. Uh, and so whatever you have, whether it be that by wisdom you can understand the word of God, whether it be that by knowledge you can know the word of God uh, or any of the gifts that you find on the list the reason God has given them uh, is in this context for the edifying of the church it's for making the body a more healthy body the same way that every ability your body has is for making you a more healthy and complete person. You know, that's why your fingers and the rest of your body can feel. Whereas your eyes can see. Uh, your nose can smell. Ears can hear. Uh, your tongue can taste. All of these things, while they may have their unique and special purposes, are important to the body as a whole. Because if you don't possess each of those abilities, uh, then what you wind up as is disabled. You know, we say someone who's blind is disabled. You know, we don't necessarily identify someone who can't smell as being disabled. Uh, but we do realize they're still at a disadvantage to others. So again, I use that 
din nou folosesc aceasta uh, to establish the context. Să stabilesc contextul. That charity Caritatea is more important than faith este mai importantă decât credința in that context. În acest context. In terms of making all other spiritual gifts în termen de a face toate celelalte daruri spirituale, including faith, incluzând credința, uh, beneficial to the body of Christ. Beneficie, uh, Because otherwise, dacă nu, uh, if they're not accompanied with charity, dacă nu sunt acompaniate cu caritatea, uh, then we'll use them selfishly. Atunci le vom pierde. Le vom pierde. And more or less, that's what we went through last week. Mai mult, um, să mă puțin, <coughs> acesta este prin ce am fost săptămâna trecută. But here, Aici, He's going to use a very special example va un of how a gift should be used and how they shouldn't. By making a comparison Prin a face between prophecy and tongues. So you have to realize that the context of what he's talking about is he's talking about doing this in the church. If not, dacă nu, uh, there will be some misunderstandings. Pot fi ne, uh, câteva neînțelegeri. Uh, because he is very specifically Din caz că este foarte specific, uh, speaking about church services. Vorbește uh, despre serviciile biserici, uh, de biserică. So, I want to begin with these verses we just read. Vreau să începem cu aceste versete care de bine am citit. Trying to understand Încercăm să înțelegem why prophecy is more important. De ce profeția este mai importantă? Uh, you know, why is it that prophecy is so much better for the church? De ce profeția este atât de mai importantă pentru biserică? Than tongues. Decât limbile. There's one verse that actually sums it up very well. Este un verset care ara, care uh, And that's verse 22. Wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Now, Paul has some really good arguments. Uh, of course, because it's the Word of God. Uh, but what we see in that one verse is this thought. The reason why tongues were given was to be a sign to the lost. They were never meant to be used in a church. It was to reach lost people who did not believe. Prophecy was for the church. So with that in mind though, it still brings you to the more important question. And that is to get a Bible understanding of what these two things are. Because you know today that there are many people who want to define speaking as tongues as someone praying Uh, or just getting up in a service and beginning to shout in some language that nobody knows. Because it, it's not a language. It's something they're making up as they go. Uh, and a lot of denominations will tell you that that's what it means to speak in tongues. Uh, but what I want you to understand is that is in no way what the Bible defines tongues as. With anything, I think you have to go back to the first time it's said. But in this time, you can just go back to the first time the gift was given. Now, the first time tongues is used in the Bible at all uh, is in the book of Genesis. <laughs> Genesis chapter 10, verse 5. When we're told that the Gentiles uh, were divided based on their tongue, uh, the land they lived in, and their family. 
It's kind of like when we read in Revelation. About people of every tribe, nation, tongue, and race. The word, the word tongue just means a known language. That's why you'll notice that the word unknown has to be included with it. Uh, it means a known language. Uh, the first time you see this gift being given out is Acts chapter 2 verse number 8. Now, most of you will know the passage. In fact, I'm going to ask you just to make sure everybody's paying attention to turn there and we'll read it. Acts chapter number 2 verse number 8. Uh, and we'll read all the way down to verse 11. Because this gives you a pretty definitive definition for what it means to speak in tongues. Anyone who tries to make it anything other than this is absolutely going against the Word of God. Alright, Acts 2 verse 8. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites uh, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. Uh, Phrasia, uh, Pamphylia, in Egypt and in parts of Libya, about uh, Cyrene, uh, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So what does God define it as? Now I know most of you know this already. But he says speaking in tongues was literally that Peter and these other people went out and began to preach openly. They began to tell about Jesus Christ. Now, we have Peter's message actually recorded for us. But if you see, they said we hear them speak. So it's evident it was more than one person preaching. No, it wasn't just Peter who was telling about Jesus. But you get this list of known languages. And according to the passage, the miracle was that everybody could hear uh, them speaking in their language. So it's evident that you know, one of those people must have been speaking in the Christian language. You know, one must have been speaking in another. Uh, and so all the people began to gather around because they heard their language. It's as simple as this. It would be the same thing as if when we do street preaching here the next Saturday, if suddenly I found myself able to preach perfectly in Dutch. And Eddie quit pretending that he could speak all these languages. And actually began speaking some of them. Now, Branislav, you already got a couple, but you'd have to pick one you don't know. So. But it'd be the same if any of us suddenly found ourselves able to proclaim the gospel in a language we didn't know, but that there were people there who needed it. That's what the gift was. 
First Corinthians 14 says that's still what it was for. Paul even states in this passage, uh, around verse 18 and 19, that he could speak in tongues. Now, whether it's because he had a gift, or whether he was just that well educated, it's not relevant. The point is that even though he had this ability, he said, I would rather uh, speak five words so that the church could understand me you know, than to preach to you all day in something you couldn't understand. Uh, because otherwise I've wasted your time. So that's what you have to understand about tongues. What you have to understand about prophecy uh, is he teaches here that it's for our edification. But something quite interesting about it uh, come in verse 4 and in verse 6. Verse 4 says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So whatever we're getting ready to define this as being, he says one of the main differences between this and tongues is that if I get up and speak to you in tongues in a church service he says the only person who's going to be edified or picked up by that is me. He says, if I prophesy, everyone will profit from that. You will all be edified by it. Well, consider something. We've already showed uh, back in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23 and 24 uh, the edification is not for you as an individual. It's something that you do for other people. Every time the word edify is used in the Bible outside of this when he says, you know, you edify yourself by speaking in tongues, every time the word is used, it's being used to talk about doing something to pick other people up. This is the only time where God says you would edify yourself. You can find examples of what I mean in Romans 14.10. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.11 uh, where you find the Bible plainly teaches that we are to seek to edify others. In fact, in chapter 10 we saw that there was a contrast there between the word edify uh, and the term expedient. Uh, and we saw that expedient is for us. Uh, it's a word that talks about helping us to go forward in our journey that God has for us. It's a word that refers to helping us go forward in the journey that God has for us. Whereas edify uh, is a word that talks about you helping lift other people. Now, you'll hear people that they'll preach on tongues and say that it's good because you can edify yourself. But never in the Bible is that considered a good thing. The only way you could say self-edification is a good thing 
un lucru bun is if you use this passage. Is that for this this passage? But again, what's the context here? Da, din nou, care este contextul? The context is that you're supposed to be putting yourself lower for the benefit of the body. Contextul este că trebuie să te pui pe tine mai prejos pentru edificarea trupului. Yeah, the thing I think that amazes me the most. Lucru care cred că mă uh, uimește pe mine cel mai mult. About people who use this passage. Despre oamenii care folosesc acest pasaj. To promote speaking in tongues. Ca să promoveze vorbirea în limbi. Uh, and some of the other gifts that we don't believe for today. But especially tongues. Is that literally the entire book of 1 Corinthians is a rebuke. You know, he's telling the Corinthian church what they've done wrong. So nobody will argue that from chapter 1 to chapter 11 is a rebuke. I don't know anybody who argues about 15 and 16 being. Every other chapter, except for these three about spiritual gifts, when you read them, you automatically assume that he's rebuking the Corinthians. And yet for some reason, When people come to these three chapters, instead of reading them as a rebuke, they read them as Paul saying, oh, good job, you speak in tongues. Now, he spends all the chapters before and after telling them what they've done wrong. He even comments on how harsh he was in his last letter when he writes them again in 2 Corinthians. And yet we pick these three chapters to be something other than a rebuke. Not because the Bible presents it that way. But because it's the only way to support our doctrine that's not biblical. The only way you could promote this is to change the context of all three chapters uh, and separate them from the rest of the book. So my point of that is that when he spoke about the importance of prophecy because it edifies others and says later I would that all of you would prophesy uh, he's teaching something simple that they need to quit trying to lift themselves up by trying to say oh, I have this gift I can say this. Every person I've ever met, and I know quite a few, who say they have the gift of speaking in tongues, it is an issue of pride for them. Uh, it's always a thing of wanting to make it about them. Anybody I know that today claims they have a gift like healing. You know what they do? They come into a church and try to make the service about them. What I have found is that any of these gifts that I can give you Bible reasons why I don't believe they're for today that we have replacements for them specifically the word of God that these gifts are not used uh, in a church service uh, because they don't draw attention to the word of God they draw attention to the person that's doing it that's one of the greatest things I think we need to see So, when's the first time that uh, prophecy is used? Numbers 11, 27 through 30. 
30. Now, you may find a different form of the word sooner. But the word prophecy, uh, the first time I find it, uh, is there. But I look at that one because it's interesting. If you know that passage, that's where Moses had become overwhelmed uh, because he had too many people. No, that's where he wants God to kill him because he's tired of the burden. Uh, and so God tells him what to do about you know setting up people to be judges you know to be leaders uh, and to help him but in this two people uh, two men go out and begin to speak uh, and so these two men Eldad and Midad Uh, go out into the camp and begin to prophesy. So people get mad. And they go to Moses. And they say, can't you see they're doing this? And Joshua gets really mad. And tells Moses, you need to make them stop. And I find his answer to be very interesting. He doesn't say anything about them stop. He looks at Joshua and says, what, are you jealous for my sake? You know, are you scared they're going to pull the people away from me? Now, are you afraid they're going to follow them instead of me now? He says, I would that all these men would prophesy. So the same thought is what Paul's teaching. Here. So whatever they're identifying this as, they're looking at the same thing. I want to read verse 5. I'm sorry, verse 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? Now, what he means in that passage, and we'll get to that in a second, is that speaking in tongues is worthless unless there is a clear thought that's trying to be conveyed. In fact, if I could entitle the passage I'm trying to get through today, uh, I would say this is the importance of a voice. But what I want you to notice right now in that is that he lists prophecy, revelation, knowledge, and doctrine together. So what that shows me is that revelation would be when God speaks to you directly. When he reveals something. Uh, that's what the word means. That's what the word, uh, the book of Revelation means. It means the great unveiling. Or in this context, revealing. Uh, knowledge is what you know. And then doctrine is what we believe about the Word of God. So where does prophecy sit in with those three things? Most people want to define this as someone telling the future. Now, if that were true, that that's all this word meant, wouldn't Revelation have covered that? Wouldn't you know, being able to give a revelation from God be giving the future? No, uh, this is a... 
The fact that this is listed with Revelation shows you that that's not uniquely what God means by this word. Uh, that God means something more in this. So it's not just the giving of doctrine. It's not just proclaiming knowledge. And it's not just giving some revelation from God. Even though we would use the word a lot of times, describe most of those things. I personally believe that all that is really required for something to be called prophecy is for it to be the proclaiming of God's word. Now, something we can learn, though, from that story back in Numbers 11 is that prophecy came not just uh, when people decided to start proclaiming the word of God but according to Moses these men spoke when God's spirit moved them to do so I personally believe that when God used the word prophecy he's more so just talking about preaching that's why I believe when prophecy is treated as a gift he's more so just speaking about the call to preach I'll give you an example why I believe that we know Timothy had two different gifts mentioned in the Bible one of them it said it come about by the laying on of hands now you could read into that many different things but the fact that it came by the laying on of hands by the elders of the church you know what I see in that laying on of hands in the Bible is God's way of making us put our approval on something. In fact, I believe the reason why when the church was first getting started that on three occasions uh, God made the 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 preachers uh, to lay their hands on people uh, before they received the Holy Spirit uh, was because he was trying to make them uh, understand and consent, you know, approve that the Holy Spirit was not just for them. Because when you look at the examples, if I remember correctly, uh, it was Gentiles or Samaritans uh, were first. So the Jews had to realize that the Holy Spirit wasn't just for the Jews but for others. And by putting on their hands they were agreeing to that. I believe the other was the Apostle Paul uh, and that Paul uh, who the church had been very much afraid of that the laying on of hands uh, and receiving the Holy Spirit was to force them to realize okay this man is from God. And to agree. You know, my point is, when you see uh, something like that going on in the Bible, every other time, except for the three times about the Holy Spirit, and about... Uh, Timothy receiving a gift, we, without question, 
Este fără întrebare. Assume that it is the church putting their approval on something. Asumăm că este biserica care este de acord cu ceva. So in these cases, I would say it's the same thing. Aș spune că este același lucru. Well, if the church had to approve for Timothy to have a gift, what gift did he have? Well, Timothy was a preacher. Timothy was a pastor. Don't we lay hands on pastors today when they're ordained? We do the same thing. Uh, not so that I can have a gift of preaching but to show that the, the church acknowledges and approves that I have so I think in Timothy's case that, that gift that was by laying on of hands was prophecy that the church was saying we've seen this guy and no question God's called him to preach so you send him out and let him preach and you know, we'll put our name behind him the same thing was done for me when I come out as a missionary so my point of that is that in understanding what these two gifts are because otherwise you won't understand the rest of this chapter is that we're going to see one of them is speaking with a clear voice of understanding proclaiming the word of God whether you identify it as any time someone gives the word of God or specifically is that call to preach which again I think fits with the fact that pretty much anybody called a prophet in the Bible unless they were just telling the future uh, is someone who was called to do so. Telling the future is treated a little bit differently. But we see with speaking in tongues that his example, if we read verse 5 and 6, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Aș dori ca voi toți să vorbiți în limbi, dar mai degrabă să profețiți, fiindcă mai fiindcă mai mare este ceea ce profețește decât ceea ce vorbește în limbi. O fară numai dacă traduce ca biserica să primească edificare. It's not that he was against tongues. Nu era că el era împotriva limbilor. Again, he said he used it all the time to reach lost people. Din nou, el a spus că el a folosit aceasta întotdeauna ca să câștige pe cei pierduți. He said it's not for the church, though. A spus că nu este pentru biserică. It's not to be done in a service. Nu era, nu este să fie făcut într-un serviciu. Because it doesn't edify anyone. Din cauza că nu edifică pe nimeni. And his reason for that is what we just read in verse 6. So if speaking in tongues is me speaking in a foreign language, and he says if you do it, you're going to want to have an interpreter so that they can at least understand what you're saying. In verse 6, uh, he says you should not do it unless it's for this reason. To give a revelation. Teach knowledge. Give prophecy. Or doctrine. So he says if it's necessary to speak in an unknown language through a translator for one of those reasons do it. 
That's literally what we're doing tonight. Now, for the most part, tonight I could have got by with speaking in English only. But there's one person who would have got nothing from it. And there's two of them that I don't know that they actually would have understood half of it. Even though they claim they understand. So my point is, so to be sure that all of you understand and not just one half or the other half, when I want to give preaching or any of those things concerning the Word of God, we employ a translator to do that. Otherwise, Paul teaches that it's a hindrance and a distraction to a service. But in a situation like this, he says it's necessary. So, just see that even in our church. Uh, that, you know, when we're doing the announcements and those things, unless I'm conveying some important truth, we pause the translation. We don't translate. Uh, but, when I'm ready to say something, that I feel like everybody needs to understand this. I want to make sure everybody's involved. We translate to Romanian. That's the same thing he's saying. That unless it was really necessary, uh, then it's going to be a hindrance. But he says, when you're giving doctrine, you want everybody to know that. When you're preaching, you want everybody to know. If you're giving some revelation from God, or just teaching, that's where knowledge comes. Uh, he said, in those cases, you want to translate. Now, I believe in his case, he would almost be speaking of the opposite. It would be more like this. If, let's just say, uh, that Branislav had a friend with him from Serbia who was a good preacher but he could only preach in Serbia. So, or let's say German even. He could do either one of those. So he's got something important to share with us but the only way to convey that is if Branislav translates. Otherwise, he can talk for six hours and we have no idea what he's saying. What he's going to show you in this is that if you really want to benefit the church, you know, don't get caught up in translating everything. You know, if that guy just wants to get up and share you know, something not important, you know, don't pause for that. But, if it's something that's for the good of the church, do you take the time and translate it? So, what he goes on to explain from this point, and that is from verse 7 till 12. So I won't have time to pause on each one and do them the justice they deserve. But let's read them and try to do our best. He says in verse 7, and even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sound, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? 
Fiindcă și trebuie, dacă dă un sunet neclar, cine se va pregăti de bătălie? Now, there's some nice stuff you can learn from this. Sunt câteva lucruri frumoase care poți să vezi din aceasta. But the thought is very simple. Dar ce vrea să spun este foarte simplu. He says, every instrument. And other things like that have a voice. And that because their voice gives a distinct sound, you can understand what they're trying to say. Otherwise, they're wasting their time. Because if I blow the trumpet, to tell you it's time for war and I don't know how to do it then you think I'm just over here practicing a trumpet. The sound means nothing to you. It's like if I pick up this guitar tonight and I have it in my heart I'm going to play Amazing Grace for you. I don't have to play guitar. It doesn't matter if in my heart I'm playing Amazing Grace. What you're getting ready here is not. You know, it's going to sound about like this. It's going to mean nothing. There will be no voice or understanding in Because you understand music does speak. I mean, you listen to a song that you know the words to. And you can hear the words being carried through the melody. Because it has a voice. But if you don't know how to play the instrument, then it becomes just a bunch of noise. So let's read so verse 9. So likewise, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it, the, it be known what is spoken, for ye shall speak into the air? What he's saying is that if you and I speak, and it's not easy to be understood. So in the context here, he's talking about me speaking in a language you don't understand. But can I say it goes even beyond that? That if I get up here and I speak very eloquently, and you don't understand me, what is the point of what I said? He said, I'm speaking to the air. You didn't get anything. Yeah, I come from a part of the States where we speak in a special way. Other people in America can't understand what we're saying. I've had to, over time, cut out some of those southern words so that you can understand me. You know, what does it matter if I use the word reckon and to me, I understand what it means. <coughs> but you, unless you happen to know it's a Bible word, and actually an accounting word that means to I count it so uh, then it means nothing to you if I say that. So did I waste your time if I use that word and you don't know what it means? Did you get anything from it? You know, was I speaking to you or just to the air? Uh, that's one of the things I think you can apply from this. Is that whether it be that you're speaking in a language nobody can understand or whether you're just using words that people don't know. If people can't understand you, Paul says you're just speaking to the air. So when we come in a church service, am I here 
So that I can get up and show you how smart I am. Somebody told me the other day, they told Lori that I have a very colorful vocabulary. And she laughed and told him that's his reduced vocabulary. Now that's when he's trying to speak simple. So my point in that is that if I spoke to you the way I would like to, I wouldn't edify you. I wouldn't help you. Because you'd only understand about half what I'm trying to say. Lori wouldn't even be able to translate all that I would say. So, who am I edifying in that case? Am I lifting you up? Helping you to know doctrine and so forth better? Or am I lifting me up? Either by trying to speak with big words and make myself look better. Or by speaking how I'm comfortable regardless of how it affects you. So in verse 11. He says, Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh uh, shall be a barbarian unto me. I believe we skip verse 10 maybe. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. What he's saying is this. Everything that makes a sound, whether it be the sound of your motor letting you know you need to change gears, everything that speaks, speaks with a purpose. And if there is no signification of what it's saying, you're not playing the right notes on the piano, then there is no understanding. He says, what happens is that when I get up here and speak, to you, I'm like a barbarian. There's someone who speaks a language that you couldn't understand. So, again, Branislav, you can be my example yet again. Because none of us speak German. Me and Eddie, I think, could get a few words from you. Hungarian, none of us speak. Serbian, none of us speak. So all of those languages have their signification. But if you're speaking to us with them, he says, like, you've come to me as a barbarian. You know, that you're speaking something none of us can understand. So how does he end this thought? Even so, even so ye, for as much as you're zealous of spiritual gifts, Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. He says, you want to have spiritual gifts. You know, you want God to use you. Stop trying to find things that make you look good. And ask God to give you things that will help the church. It, all, it comes back to this simple thing. You find people all the time in Pentecostal churches who are begging God for the gift of speaking in tongues. 
Yeah, I had a friend who prayed most of his life for that. Why do none of them ever pray, God, give me the gift of ministry? You know, let me have a servant's heart that I can take care of other people. You know, God, give me wisdom to understand your word. So that I can teach it to other people. Yeah. God give me give a gift of giving. So that I can help others. Yeah. Why does nobody ask for that? Because you don't get praise for that. You know, the Barnabases... The, those people who have a gift of consolation, Aceste, uh, acești, encouragement, exhortation. They never get <coughs> praised. Ei nu, uh, they don't get lifted up. Ei nu because their gift is lifting up other people. Same thing for servants. Same thing for givers. You know the only way those people get lifted up? Is if other people also become servants and givers. And encouragers. He said, you're going to try to fight for a gift and beg God to help you? Look for one that edifies the church and doesn't just lift you up. 